James Loney is an activist and member of the Christian Peacemaker Teams, a group that places violence reduction teams in crisis situations and militarized areas around the world at the invitation of local peace and human rights workers. In November 2005, Mr. Loney and three other team members were taken hostage while working in Iraq and were held captive until March of 2006. With me in studio to tell us about his experience and the work that CPT does in Iraq and elsewhere is James Loney, a program coordinator for the Christian Peacemaker Teams here in Canada. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for having me. Why don't we start, I guess, by talking about CPT and I guess both the philosophy that it operates and maybe some of the examples of the activism or action that it takes. Mm -hmm. CPT was uh, started by a group of historic peace churches, Mennonite Church of the Brethren and Quakers, uh, about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea was um, to, you know, instead, uh, this group of churches being pacifists, <coughs> they're I think their primary um, uh, way of living that was to not participate in war. Mm -hmm. And I think there were some people that felt, well, we need to do more than that and to um, uh, kind of take it to the next step. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was to uh, place teams trained in uh, the disciplines of uh, peacemaking in areas of violent conflict and to take some of the same risks that soldiers take. Mm -hmm. um, uh, using the tools of peace instead of weapons of war. Could you maybe elaborate on sort of what peacemaking entails or what the types of skills that these activists would have? Uh, it would involve um, human rights documentation. Mm -hmm. um, it would involve um, physical presence, being in a place where violence uh, is happening or at risk of happening and trying with our presence to reduce mm -hmm. uh, a violence. Uh, even how do you, you know, bring out, out a camera in a situation where uh, violence could be occurring could um, could be very effective. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of, if I were to literally put yourself in between, let's say, the aggressor mm -hmm. and the victim of that aggression, would that be a correct? Example? That would be an example of being of a physical presence uh, mm -hmm. that we sometimes would would do, um, particularly uh, in uh, the West, our West Bank projects in in Palestine, uh, in Hebron, in uh, at Tumani, a little uh, shepherd village. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for example, if, um, if uh, Israeli soldiers are um, uh, threatening a, a Palestinian, uh, perhaps to beat them up or to physically intimidate them, we might, you know, we sometimes call it the grandmother effect of just being present, you know, pulling out a camera, a notebook, uh, if possible, just to gently slide uh, our bodies in, in the way or mm -hmm. to be a presence at a at a checkpoint just observing and that uh, goes a long way towards um, reducing abuses. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's a system. potential deterrent, right, in the sense yes. that hopefully it discourages the aggressor or the person committing the violence that they can't get away with it, That's that right. there are people who are witnessing mm -hmm. and ideally wanting to stop if mm -hmm. they could in peaceful means what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit more, I guess, about Iraq politically and, and culturally. How did you guys choose Iraq as a place in which really peacemaking is, I would say, a very desirable aspect, but also a challenging one? Well, the, the Iraq project began um, at the end of 2002 when the, in the, the sort of the build up towards war mm -hmm. uh, and the global cry against war at that time. And we were um, working with a group uh, uh, the Iraq peace team uh, that had that was sponsoring delegations and trying to um, to work against the war, and so we've maintained a presence uh, in Iraq since that time. Um, and um, uh, well, we've we've withdrawn our uh, uh, our team uh, recently. Mm -hmm. So um, our our work began with trying to stop the war of being against of of speaking against the sanctions uh, and then moved to um, to focus on the plight of security de detainees, mm -hmm. the thousands of men that had been swept up by the American forces and held without charge um, without access to lawyers um, indefinitely mm -hmm. and uh, well and this is something that I, I feel is underreported in the press that you hear yes. a lot about let's say Western military casualties but not about Iraqi civilian or as mm -hmm. you say the type of 
really illegal detainment of a lot of Iraqis by Americans and by the Iraqi regime. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that this was, I, I would say, quite rampant or quite um, more active practice than is led on, certainly as that we know of here in the West? Yes, it was. Um I mean, now there are uh, a leadership where I, th I saw something like 19,000 uh, security detainees. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, uh, when I was there in 2004, uh, my second time in Iraq, there was, the United States was saying something like eight to 9,000. Um, and that was just their number. It wasn't really, uh, I think, an accurate number. Mm -hmm. um, well, and one wonders how it could be verified, given that there isn't really a process of accountability That's right. that gives pe these detainees any basic rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, American uh, military officials have said that you know, up to ninety-five percent of them are uh, are innocent, mm -hmm. and it was just the practice of sweeping people up, usually at midnight uh, house raids, and. Uh, and looking for some kind of information. Maybe they know somebody who knows somebody and, uh, and torture being um, a, a, a common practice to try to extract information. Mm -hmm. And so we were, we were working on all this uh, just before the Abu Ghraib uh, scandal broke in, in the news. And that was the, the focus uh, of our work. And then we began to uh, document um, torture being done by the Ministry of Interior. And uh, when when we were kidnapped, and, and that was in November of of 2005, and that was um, that ground that work to a halt because then the team had mm -hmm. to focus on on other things. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just take a break for a moment, but let's come back and talk about that. Both, I guess, the perils that one can face in putting oneself on the line in these situations, but also, I guess, the relationship one has to that type of situation, both pleasant and very unpleasant. So we'll just come back in a moment. I'm speaking with James Loney from the Christian Peacemaker teams. You're watching 3D Dialogue. We'll be back with more after the break. Welcome back to 3D Dialogue. I'm Jesse Hirsch. And I'm in studio today with James Loney, Program Coordinator for the Christian Peacemaker Teams in Canada. Now, before the break, I guess in illustrating the work that CPT does, you certainly demonstrated that part of it is literally putting your body on the line by mm -hmm. going into conflict zones, and really being vulnerable to the conflicts that's there. Mm -hmm. You were essentially taken hostage for mm -hmm. an extended period of time. Without getting into the details of that experience, maybe you could tell us a bit how it perhaps impacts your own commitment to this type of activism, and maybe, I guess, some of the reflections you've had after this experience, I guess, was completed, or what you were essentially liberated or freed mm -hmm. from that setting. Mm -hmm. Well, it was... Um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost track of the... Um, uh, just re can you rephrase the first part of that again? Well, essentially, I mean, do you feel that this experience discourages or deters your commitment to this type of activism, or is it really part of it? Is making oneself vulnerable and putting oneself on the line really central to the commitment for peace and the commitment for peacemaking? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, vulnerability really is uh, essential to, to peacemaking. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the idea that we have that... Um, you know, I guess it it makes me reflect on what is the kind of power that we are trying to exercise in a situation. Mm -hmm. In in a situation where there is conflict, we do need to have some kind of power. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is it the power of of the gun or is it the power of the cross? Is it the mm -hmm. power of of vulnerability of of accepting suffering rather than uh, inflicting it? And mm -hmm. and a whole other um, when we enter into a conflict um, with violence. Uh, we enter into a spiral that, uh, that takes us inexorably upward into only one of two possible outcomes, either winner or loser, mm -hmm. you know, dominate or be dominated. Mm -hmm. and, um, Which is kind of a lose-lose situation. 
or or win lose, mm -hmm. uh, which is the uh, when you win, it's the appearance of of a, a victory, but really um, nothing changes. Mm -hmm. um, we were we were rescued by uh, military force, the British special forces, and in the way I, I think of it, I mean I'm delighted to be here, and it's a it's a sort of a paradox that I'm free because of the use of armed force, mm -hmm. which is not what I wanted. But, you know, guys with guns pick, you know, came and took us, and then bigger guys with bigger guns came and took them, and, but the gun is still mm -hmm. in charge. There's no really any, any change. And, and I think that both captor and uh, rescuer really are working out of the same paradigm, the mm -hmm. same worldview, mm -hmm. that, that violence, you know, um, that we can use violence to, to get the outcome that we want. But in fact, you become the very thing that you detest or don't want to be mm -hmm. when you use violence. Um, well, and it's interesting that now after, it, it seems as if they're asking you to almost commit violence in essentially putting your captors to death. Mm -hmm. and that they would face the death penalty and they're asking you to testify mm -hmm. and essentially almost sentence them to death. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about how you feel about that or the way that you try to withdraw yourself from that spiral. Well, that, that's a, it was a very difficult uh, decision uh, because one of us was killed, Tom uh, Fox, mm -hmm. and um, you know, some in his family in particular, I think, really wanted some accountability or something to, you know, uh, and kidnapping is a massive problem in, in Iraq. Um, but the, to me, uh, the death penalty is, is nothing more than legalized vengeance. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, to, to murder or to kill somebody with a social sanction, with a, with a law uh, or under the, the permission of a law, who killed someone else? You know, the, it's no different right. uh, than the people who murdered Tom. Right. It's the same. Kind it's the of same thing. violence, the same literally murder, as you say. And there's been enough suffering uh, that's happened uh, from this. And what we want, I think, is for something different, something new, mm -hmm. something good to come come out of it. And mm -hmm. I think I love that phrase of uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. You know, no future without forgiveness. That with mm -hmm. forgiveness becomes comes the possibility of something new. And genuinely different can can emerge. Mm -hmm. That's different from the past, the suffering and pain and violence of the past. Well, and it strikes me, speaking of power, that that act of forgiveness is very powerful. That mm -hmm. it is not just in the personal or the collective, but on a society level. To see that level of compassion, I think, is both inspiring, but also may, perhaps gets people to step back and say, "Is there really a purpose to this violence or an mm -hmm. end to this violence?" Mm -hmm. Do you see, because of your work? A difference in, let's say, the attitude towards the war in Iraq, or the attitude towards that type of really violent spiraling out of control that we see in that region. Um, I think that uh, you know it's a long road of mm. uh, of of trying to see in a different way and to respond in a different way. And I think we are socialized, you, you know, uh, to respond violently. Mm -hmm. You know, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. That you know. Uh, you know, you, I'll get you if you get me, or you know, you hurt me, I'll hurt you back. Uh, that's our image of justice, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that uh, it's a long process of trying to um, um, to talk about a different way. And I think all of our various religious traditions offer us a, a different way uh, in, into into sort of repairing or healing the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think that um, what's happening now is there's a, ma there's a massive withdrawal of support from the war in Iraq. Um, and I think some of the ugliness of, of, of what was put into place there by the, this military intervention is mm -hmm. starting to, to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, um, I don't, I think there's still a lot of work, more work for 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 us to do before we can. What I, what I would love to see would be the abolition of war as an institution, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. a legitimate way to to reconcile uh, and address conflict, um, and to have um, yeah, to have an alternative to that. We abolished slavery, and uh, they said the women. We said the women could never have uh, the vote, and and. Uh, you know, we have made many dramatic uh, changes, and I think, 
I'd love to see the abolition of war as one of them. I absolutely share that vision, and I thank you for coming too, and hopefully, certainly people in our audience will learn more from CPT via its website, and thank you very much for coming. As thank you I for say, hopefully me. the abolition of war will be something we'll see in our lifetime. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was James Loney, Program Coordinator for the Christian Peacemaker Teams here in Canada. Up next, we'll tell you about the Shouters Baptist Faith. Please stay tuned. You're watching 3D Dialogue.